Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank, New York Community Bank, Eastern Consolidated, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citizens Bank, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marinkoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. The Upper West Side of Manhattan, Riverdale, DeWitt Clinton High School, Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois. Oh boy, now get involved with the printing business, City College, Baruch College. No, there's a company called Phyllis Van Usen, the 417 shirt, Mishula Rickless, BVD. No, other things, another shirt company, Damon, Lavon, all the others. Custom shirts, charities, involvement, community. I'm going to be an insurance guy. I'm going to be one of the best insurance guys in the group and personal coverage. I have Rick Lira, my friend from the Cambridge Insurance Solutions, correct? Good morning, Michael. Good morning. So tell me about your parents. Let's start from mom's side, because mom's side, you had Nana. Uh, mom and her mom. Grew up on Riverside Drive. Uh, my grandfather was in the stock market. Uh, unfortunately, he died the year that I was born. Uh, and both were very giving, loving, uh, warm, effervescent people. Tell me about Popside. Popside, uh, my grandfather was a dentist, very reserved, had a practice in Brooklyn, then in Manhattan. Uh, and my grandmother uh, came from a family of eight siblings uh, from Brooklyn, and uh, their maiden name was Garfinkel, and we don't know if that's any relationship to the Garfinkel. But wasn't there some actor they were involved with? Yes, the name Garfinkel was changed, I believe, to the name Gary, and Sid Gary was a vaudeville actor that worked with uh, George Burns. And then they broke up and Burns went on to... Uh, so you could have been in the, the family, could have been in the world of entertainment. Right, right. Grandpa, your father's side, he was a dentist, okay? He went to NYU, I think, for dental school. Dad was born... 1917. 1917, okay. He went to City College. Uh, and he was in the military in India, right? Yes, he was uh, a master sergeant stationed in India um, and had a great experience during a very difficult time. You know, what did he do in India? 
He was responsible for all of the supplies that came into this camp of roughly four or five thousand soldiers. And uh, he was a tennis player. As a matter of fact, he taught me how to play. Yes, we have that nice picture of you <laughs> attempting to hold the tennis racket, yes. And the lieutenant that he worked for, this is a family story, um, wanted to play tennis. So he said to my father, Bob, requ uh, request some tennis equipment. Three months later, over 5,000 tennis rackets were shipped in. I think 200 tennis nets and cartons and cartons of balls. And what they do with that afterwards? I have no idea. Okay, so he comes back after the war, okay? I believe it, he was married prior to the, the war. Yes. Okay. He came back six months after I was born. You ever find out how mom and dad met? I guess back then there was a very tight community in Manhattan, and they hung out with a lot of different friends. Um, and I really don't know exactly how they met, but I think it was through a mutual introduction. So when dad came back from the army in India, is that when he goes into the business in the printing and the uh, letter business? No, he was in the uh, girl's dress business. And I used to, uh, when he would come home, I'd say, Dad, how many dresses did you sell? And he would tell me whatever he would tell me. And then something happened uh, where he decided to leave. Or See, the... but now everything comes to light with the, the, the clothing. Your father in the girl's dress business your involvement with clothing later on, but we'll talk about that. So what happens one day? So either the company went under or he left and he didn't know what he wanted to do. He was a very accomplished typist. And I think he was recorded at typing over 100 words a minute. So he decided- That's how he ordered all of the tennis material, right. typing very fast. So he, he started doing a typing service for market research firms. And he started it out of the house. My mother was helping him and it started to grow. And then he moved into the flower district in the 20s and opened up Lawrence Letter Service, which was a statistical typing and printing business for advertising and marketing. Now there was some involvement with Macy's. What was their involvement with Macy's? That was one of their largest accounts for circulars that they would distribute and they would call them up the night before and want five or ten thousand circulars by eight o'clock in the morning uh, and he would print them. So now let's fast forward. So dad's back and in 1946 at New York Poly Hospital which ironically was directly across the street from the old Madison Square Garden. Exactly. Um, young Ricky is born. Correct. Okay, so Rick is born. Uh, this time you're living on the West End? We're on living the West on Side? Riverside Drive and 107th Street. Right, and then, but there was that one picture, you know, of a, a Shraff, so you got down to Midtown, you know, the picture of you and your dad and Shraff's really dapper looking. They, uh, my father loved to dress, so did my mom, and uh, they loved to go out, and unfortunately, Shraff's is no longer. So what happens next? How do you leave the borough of Manhattan to go to the Bronx, but not the Bronx, to Riverdale. How old were you when you moved to Riverdale? Uh, I was six, and from what I understand, there was a migration of the Upper West Side people going to Long Island, going to Jersey, and going north to Westchester. Uh, they had grown up in apartments. Riverdale was, was really rural compared to where it is today. Um, and we moved into a large two-bedroom apartment with my brother. And Grandma and Nana lived upstairs, right? Later? No, they, uh, they lived in another building in this in the complex. complex. Okay. Um, and it was wonderful. Uh, there, was, there were probably 300 families in about six or seven buildings. Little punch ball? Absolutely. Okay, stick ball? Right. You said you, had, you loved growing up. It was a great environment. We had a group of friends. Everyone went out, played ball, touched football on concrete. Uh, there was a, a wooded section behind the, uh, the complex. We'd go in the woods and climb trees. Uh, it was a very bonding 
experience. It, w it was wonderful. So public school was where? PS81 in the Bronx. And that, and that went directly to junior high school? Junior high school, a new junior high had just opened, junior high 141. Now you said public school was close by. Junior Lock high, away. Junior high was a bus, bus, bus ride. ride. And then to go to DeWitt Clinton, this great alma mater up in the Bronx, 5,000 men right. next to Bronx Science over there. So tell me about the days at uh, DeWitt Clinton. High school was, uh, was a very good experience. Uh, most of my friends either went to Clinton, music and art, or science. So we'd travel with our buddies. Uh, the school had a tremendous sports uh, program. There, were, uh, there was a leadership program that I was chosen to, to go on. And it was a wonderful experience. So how did you get into the air conditioning duct business <laughs> during high school? Which you uh, said to me you made some good money, but what did you do in the air conditioning duct business? During the, the summers, uh, when I was 15 or 16, uh, I wasn't going to camp. I had gone to Boy Scout camp, um, and I wanted to make money. So a friend of my parents had this air conditioning installation business, and uh, he hired me for the summer with about seven or eight other guys, and I couldn't drive at the time, so I was the shotgun. And if you recall, Michael, in, in the old buildings, there were sleeves where an air conditioner would go into the wall. So people would buy air conditioners at Masters or the Kmarts of that time. Or Corvettes. Or Corvettes, okay, right. Please, right. And then they would have them delivered and... The Viga. Correct. Um, so I was on a truck. We had 20 air conditioners in the car and we had to deliver them. And I was the, the young Jewish kid on the truck because all the, the older guys were the Irish and Italian guys. We know that mom and dad were fashionistas, okay? You said to me, you used to go on certain parts of the Bronx to go for fashion. It was like in New York, in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, they had Field Brothers. You know, Manhattan had Barney's Boys Town. But what was up in the, in the Bronx, the fashion store? On you, Fordham you know, Road in the Bronx, uh, near the old Jans, there was a store called J&F, and it was the height of Ivy. Ivy was just becoming very important. And on Saturday afternoons, uh, my buddies and I would go over there, we'd hang out, we'd save our money and, and buy a button-down shirt. Uh, so it was something that we all enjoyed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's getting closer to apparel. Okay, you graduate from DeWitt Clinton, and how do you decide on this little school in Peoria? Well, there were two schools that I really wanted to apply for, University of Toledo and Bradley. Bradley had a wonderful basketball team, and uh, I made both schools. My best friend at the time also applied to Bradley, and uh, we decided that's where we are going to go. So you spent one year there, and Dad's business needed a little help. You came back to go to work with Dad. Yeah, Dad had some uh, business difficulties. Uh, he lost about four or five employees. Business had turned, um, and he couldn't afford to keep me in school, out of town. Uh, and it was the first time I had ever seen him or heard him cry when he called me at school and said I had to come home. So you came home, you're working with him, and you're also going to Baruch, and how do you end up at 417 Fifth Avenue? Well, after helping my father and getting into the printing business, it became evident to me that this was not fun. It wasn't my passion. He had gotten back on his feet, and uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started looking at the New York Times at, the, at that particular time. That's how you found a job. Right. And there was a job for an assistant or a trainee merchandising manager. And I had always loved clothes. Our generation was into jeans and the, the clothing revolution was just beginning in the uh, late 60s. So I applied for the job and I got it. And that started my career. At Phillips Square. Van Usen. Yes. Okay. And I was very fortunate. Uh, 
the founders of the company were Seymour and Larry Phillips was his son, and they were renowned in the industry. And uh, Larry Phillips became a mentor of mine. He liked me. I was a 22-year-old kid, um, and he was very encouraging. So it, it so you, you're with him for a couple of years. You get promoted. How do you end up at uh, Mishula Rickless's company called BVD? Well, uh, after four and a half years at Phillips Van Usen, I had risen up into the ranks, and I was made an offer to go to Mishulam, one of Mishula Rickless's companies. And being aggressive and wanting to earn more money, I took the job. Uh, and then six months after I took the job, uh, my boss, who was the uh, general merchandising, VP of merchandising, quit. And the senior VP of the company comes in and says, Rick, can you handle the job? And I was quite nervous. And I said, of course I can. Uh, and then he said, good, because in two weeks we're going to Hong, Hong Kong. Kong, Taiwan, and... Uh, we're going to look at making large purchases. And, and it was your first international trip because your only trip otherwise was to Peoria, Illinois. Exactly. I had never been out of the country. So this was interesting. It so was fascinating. Uh, and then while we were in Hong Kong, um, we got, my boss got a call that M Mr. Rickless wanted us to go to Israel because it was 1973, right after the war, to look at manufacturing facilities over there. He was a very large philanthropist and uh, donator to Israel and Israeli bonds. So you got to Israel now. So we went to Israel and we saw one or two factories, but what really amazed me, because here I'm coming from the States, uh, an upper middle class or a middle class lifestyle, Every cafe we went to, there were soldiers sitting there with guns. And this was after the war, and it was just SOP. This is, uh, and it was a culture shock. You know, it was mm -hmm. quite a culture shock, but it was a wonderful experience. We came back, and I stayed at BBD for a couple of years, and then went on to Damon. Damon was a f fancy shirt company? Yes. And I went there as the merchandising manager. And what was happening in the industry was uh, the mod fashion movement was coming in from England. So men were now into print shirts and wild sport shirts. So my sport shirt division went from $1 million to about $10 million. Nick uh, Nick, the old Nick Nick company, right. became very so, revelant. So you, so you got the bug at this time and saying, you know what, I'm working for somebody. Isn't it time for me to get involved. So the, is that when you go and get the Lavon? Yes, designers were becoming the rage. Pierre Cardin, Calvin Klein. Uh, and growing up with an entrepreneurial family, I didn't want to work for someone. I wanted my own business. The license for Lavon became available and I partnered with uh, the gentleman that owned the contracting factory in Morgantown, West Virginia. And he was also the big money man. So I knew that he wanted to do something with a designer brand. I made contact with the Lombon people in, in New York. Uh, originally, they turned us down. And we kept knocking on their door. Finally, they said we could meet with the executives in Paris. We flew over to Paris. Uh, we cut a license deal a five-year deal, and uh, came back, and we started the company. I had to hire salespeople, uh, buy the fabric, design it, and then go and uh, try to sell it. Our market was Better Men's Specialty Stores, the Barneys of the World, uh, the shops in towns, uh, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. So how many years is that? Uh, we did that for five years, and in the early to mid-80s, the market started to change. Discounters came in. Department stores were making it very difficult to sell, not to sell in, but if your goods didn't sell, they would send them back and right, charge yeah, you back. Uh, 
Um, so we had the opportunity to sell the company to a group of Canadians that were looking for a toehold in, in the States. Uh, and it, it was, it's a difficult business. You have to be right every six so, months. So we got, I, got, I got something little missing in my mind, okay? Because after that, I know there's the Remington Razor guy, Victor Kayam, that we'll talk about. But when did you get into the custom shirt business? When we were doing uh, Lombon, a lot of men that I, mean, I we knew. got this article from the Daily News with you and my our, our mutual friend Paul Rich of you measuring him on custom shirts. I had a concept that executives, whether they be accountants, lawyers, insurance people, or as the article said, baby boomers, baby boomers, didn't have the time. Everyone was very aggressive, trying to build their careers balance the work ba uh, life with a family. And I was making better, manufacturing better shirts. I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could go so up to someone's office? So simultaneously of doing the Lavon label, you were doing the custom shirt yes. business. And you competed with the custom shop. We and did. with the other store on 44th Street that's still there, you would go out literally and cut measure? Well, I hired, I thought it would be very interesting to hire women because of the, uh, you know, it would be a different approach. So we did made to measure. We had about seven women calling on the Wall Street firms, law firms, insurance companies uh, that would go up with a sample case, about four or 500 swatches. We'd promise delivery in four weeks. We'd embroider their initials. Yeah, I mean, the brochure, the cufflinks, you know, the different types you know, the different colors, you know, you, the, exactly what you're wearing, you know, with the, 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 the blue shirt with the white uh, collar, Michael Douglas type of thing. So, so you have that business, love and you sell. You now get involved with Victor Kayam. Victor Kayam was this uh, corporate raider and... and uh, right, he was a leverage buyout. Leverage one of the first buyout. leverage buyouts. He used to put a number of companies, but the biggest one was Remington Shaver because and he, he did a wonderful ad. Remember, right. he did his own ad, and then so he had bought a company uh, that was more of a manufacturing company that had a host of licenses that they never did anything with. And the president of the company, a man by the name of George Herman, was a friend of mine that I had known for years, and we were having lunch. And he said, you know, I'm getting rid of all these licenses. And I said, what are they? And he said, Fila amongst one of the names. And I said, George, and he was really a, a production maven. Uh, I said, that's a license to steal. Born Borg had just. Right, he was the big guy. You know, Fila had the, the, the Fila. Uh, the logo. The logo. Everybody had the tennis outfit, the jacket, and the pants. You know? And they were selling tennis shorts at that time at an unheard price of $75 a, a pair. So here, this gentleman is telling me they've got the license and it's sitting on their shelf. So I made a proposal to him that why don't we take that license and market it throughout the country because Fila and their clothing was in every department store, every, spe every sports specialty store. He said, well, he said, I'll tell you what, go over to Italy, see what you can do, see if you can renegotiate the deal come back and present it to myself and Victor. So I took my wife and we went over to Italy, uh, went to all of the manufacturers, put a sample line together, came back, presented to Victor, and he said, okay, launch it. But you wanted 25% of the business, and he I said, did. forget about it. He looked at me and he said, kid, do you want to make money or do you want to have your own business? I said, both. And, and he, he said, said, you can only go one way. Okay, with like three and a half minutes left, we got to get to how you got into the insurance business, into Cambridge. After we sold the, the apparel company, uh, after 20 some odd years, I lost a lot of hair. Okay, it's a very tough business. Yeah, but you business. look similar to Pop, as we have a picture of you and Dad, similar hair, hairline. A very, very close friend of mine had just sold a property and casualty business. We started looking for businesses to buy, and after six months, I said, I have to go back to work. I have two kids. He said, why don't we go into the insurance business? I said, I don't know how to spell insurance, let alone. He said, look, 
you're good at marketing, you're good with people, you're trustworthy. Go back to school, get your licenses, I'll teach you the sales aspect, the marketing aspect, how not to take advantage of people. 30 years ago, we opened Cambridge. Uh, we've got over 3,000 individual clients and dozens and dozens of and, corporate clients. And, and the clients. specialty is group? A major portion of it, we formed the company based on individual life, disability, buy, sells, and right. estate work. Uh, which has evolved and grown, but the employee benefits has been such a big market, and that's a major portion of our business today for law firms, accounting firms, manufacturing right. firms. Right, and you have a new product, but we're going to only limit it for time. It's called Legacy, right? Yes. And what yes. is that? Legacy is a way for us baby boomers that are concerned about the financial stability of not our children, but our grandchildren. How are they going to afford college 15 and 20 years from now? So there, is, there are very special programs that we've developed that give a discount to a couple for life insurance that can be passed on to their grandchildren tax-free at half the cost of normal insurance. So we call this the Living Legacy Plan. And it's evolved now to philanthropy. To give you an example, we had a gentleman that was asked to donate $250,000 to right. the medical school. He didn't want to take that amount of money right now, so, so we bought a policy for about $10,000. Which will give the medical school on his death a quarter of a million dollars, right? 500000 500, Great. And it's costing him $9,000. With regard to legacy, let's talk about how do you meet your wife, Diane? When I was in the apparel industry, one of my salesmen that came up to New York uh, for a trade show, I was separated. He fixed me up with Diane, who he had met in Chicago. She was living on Christopher Street. I was living on Lexington and 32nd Street. And she had this hair, and she was very funky. And I was wearing a three-piece suit. And we looked at each other, and we, we didn't know where each was coming from. Right. But there was great chemistry. And Diane is a social worker? She's Psychi a social worker, a specialist in psychotherapy. Right and somatic experience. Okay, and let's talk about son, daughter, and grandchildren. I have a daughter that just recently graduated NYU. Amanda. Amanda, uh, with her master's in digital marketing, integrated marketing. She lives in New York City. My son, Justin, lives in uh, Berkeley. And his wife? His wife, with his wife, Lisa, and he has given us two grandchildren, Lakin and Belle who are seven and five, and we see them every, uh, every three months. So it was very appropriate that dad, you know, was in the women's dress business and brought that f business into you, into your feeling, learning the, 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 the apparel business. And as I always say, the better life stories have salt, okay? Each letter means something. But the important letter for you is A, the adaptability to change, T, the tenacity, L, a little luck, and seizing the opportunity. And I'm happy that my friend Rick has all four characteristics, and thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael.